I've tried to have on this show now for about the past eight months. I first saw his face in New York City on a television screen very, very late one night in the middle of this program on a local spot on WNBC-TV. His name is Freddie Laker. And he stood before this monstrous DC-10 and he said, not many people put their name on the airplane. This man owns Freddie Laker Airways or Laker Airways. And he is now selling tickets between New York and London at a, at a fraction of their original cost as compared to, say, five years ago. It's called a SkyTrain, and he is about to inaugurate that service between Los Angeles and London. And I don't know the exact fare. What is it, round trip from here to London on, on, when, when Laker gets steamed up? About 320 bucks. And if you fly first class on, uh, on one of the international carriers between Los Angeles and London, the fare can, can run to $1,100, $1,200. So he knocks off a big chunk of change in return for which the passenger gives up some things that most airline passengers don't care about anyway like uh, free coffee and free booze and fancy meals and uh, Caesar salad mixed at the table. Uh, a lot of people choose to give that up and take the savings in their pocket so they can spend the money when they're on their vacations or whatever. So Laker is here tonight to talk about this service and the difficulties he has had inaugurating not only the Los Angeles London service, which begins in September of this year, but the service between New York and London, which began just about uh, oh, eight, nine months ago. Now, we had him booked in New York City for last October, and we were in the middle of a program when we found out that his plane was late. Not Laker Airways planes, but an American carrier that was flying him, I believe, from Toronto down to New York City. And we could not get studio space, nor was Mr. Laker going to be available in New York for the rest of our trip. But he is here in Los Angeles now, setting up his operations for the SkyTrain between here and there. And we'll chat with him about how airline service has changed drastically ever since he started the, uh, the uh, service between New York and London. Now, if you notice, you can get no frills fares and chicken feed fares. And uh, uh, th there must be 14 different fares available on every flight between point A and B in this country and around the world. And I think in large measure, we can thank Freddie Laker. Uh, on the one hand, for making it possible for us to buy airline fares at less money. On the other hand, so confusing the fare picture that few of us can understand it anymore. But he'll be out here to differentiate between the two. Now here is Sir Freddie Laker, Sir Freddie because he was knighted earlier this month, who announced today that he would begin a Los Angeles to London SkyTrain service this fall. He's with us tonight to tell us how he feels about the success of his air service, his airline, and how a young cockney boy grows up to become rich, famous, and knighted by the Queen. But that's for later. Today, Pan American applied, I think, for service between Boston and Amsterdam uh, at a fare of $99 one way, $149 round trip. Now, two years ago, Sir Freddie, that would have been unthinkable. Do you, th do you have the feeling that they're all trying to get on your bandwagon right now? Well, I think that they've all learned a trick or two in terms of marketing. I haven't seen this particular fare of uh, Pan American, but it's obviously uh, below cost, that's for sure. And uh, when this type of fare is put forward by a high-cost operator such as Pan American, we then should be looking to the front of the airplane to see how much they're adding to the first-class fare and the economy fare to pay for it, because this fare is patently below cost. But having said that, I'm all in favor of the consumer. I believe in free and unfettered competition. And uh, I think it demonstrates that Pan American that have had a reputation in the past of being a bit sort of almighty and fuddy-duddy, it demonstrate that, that this demonstrates that they're getting into the real arena of competitive airfare. How did Freddie Laker, who most of us never heard of, who owned some airplanes over in Great Britain and operated an airline company that, as I say, most people were not aware of at all, get the idea that there was a market for low-cost service between New York and London? And, I, and an idea, I might say, that drove the major carriers up the wall when you were seeking certification and applying for landing rights in this country and in Great Britain. Well, I applied for the SkyTrain service originally eight years ago on the 15th of June. So it's taken all that time to get there. But of course, the fact that you haven't heard of me is basically because I've only been in the air business for 32 years owning and operating airplanes and of course on the other side of the Atlantic. on the other side of the Atlantic and not offering consumer flights and uh, in well, this country uh, well I was going to say I think I've been offering consumer flights but they haven't generally been recognized uh, I've been called everything from a maverick Johnny come lately all that sort of thing 
but uh, I have been carrying something like 150 to 200,000 people across the Atlantic for, for some years, and we do manage to carry about half a million people a year on package holidays in Europe and have done for many, many years. So it isn't so much that I haven't been known, it's the fact that I've been fighting and battling with the bureaucrats and the governments and the regulators and, of course, that wretched price-fixing cartel called IATA. And uh, we really haven't been able to break out from the almost uh, a prison called IATA. That's to IATA, International yes, Air Travel... International Air Transport Association. Association. It's the trade union of airlines that have been fixing the price ever since World War II. Now, wasn't there an airline, or is there not an airline called Icelandic that for years refused to join IATA yes. and did fly some transatlantic uh, flights? And they do now, and they fly to Luxembourg. But once again, th this demonstrates the, the straitjacket that some of us have been in for many years. Even today, 1978, Luftlieder, or Icelandic as you call it, are still only permitted to operate their low fare flights from the United States to Luxembourg. They're not allowed to operate the low fare flights into England, for example, or France or Germany. How can you make a profit offering basically a coach seat between New York and London for about $260 round trip, give or take a few bob? Well, I think that I have... When the other airlines have been telling us for years, or IATA, or IATA has been telling us for years, hey, we guarantee your safety, we have all these rules and regulations, but we've also determined the fare has got to be 750 or whatever it is. How can you make a profit at that thing? Well, first of all, I want to uh, get you away from the misdirection about the coach seat. The airplanes that I use, the, the wide-body DC-10, is the same airplane that everyone else uses. There's nothing different about the airplane. The, the answer to the question is specialization. I specialize in low fare air transport. The airplanes are usually adapted for this business. For example, I don't own, let alone carry a first class seat. I don't carry cargo. In consequence, I have one class airplanes. We like to think they're all first class, of course. Uh, we put the kitchens downstairs. We've taken the smell out of the sitting room, so to speak. That gives us more room in the airplane to put the seats. And in consequence, we operate the DC-10, the 345 economy class seats. They're all reclining. They have a minimum of 34 to 35 inches of pitch between them. And we have the same service on board as any other air carrier. But the difference is that we offer the air transport at the minimum cost and we sell everything else that goes with it. In other words, we don't charge a fare that permits us to pour whiskey into the fellow's ear, you know, as if it's mm -hmm. sort of just been invented. If the fellow wants a glass of whiskey on our airplane, he pays for it. If he wants to eat, he pays for it. Or he can bring his own food. We don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got movers on the airplanes, but of course you pay extra for it. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it's a very tightly knit company. It's an individually owned company. It's real private enterprise. There aren't a lot of stock, uh, aren't, a lot of, aren't a lot of issues of stock on the market that one would want to go out and buy Laker Airways right now. There are, there's no, no stock, stock on the market. Sale, right? None. Absolutely none. Now, it's, if I wanted to have a dinner and watch a picture and have a couple of boozes and a cup of coffee, roughly what would it cost me above the fare? to have that? Well, the meal would cost you $3, mm -hmm. the movie w will cost you $2, and we charge a dollar for the drink, and it's duty-free, but it's a, a fair size one. You don't need too many to get sloshed. So, no, I don't want to get sloshed. No, but you could get happy, let's put it that way. For about $8 altogether, you could get reasonably happy. And uh, that would give you the movie and the food. But how are you able to do that where the others have said so long they could not? Well, in, in terms of food, of course, we don't throw any away. You see, we don't waste food. We don't put food on the airplane for everyone to eat and half of them leave it. And we reckon that that alone, in terms of wasted food, 
saves us $1,400 a day. And as I say, we have a very tightly knit organization. Uh, my office is in the corner of the hangar where we maintain the airplanes. We have a five-story office block in the corner of the building. We don't have a lift. No, or an elevator, I'll beg your okay. pardon. Not because we can't afford an elevator, but every day I have to pass the officers of each department in the organization. And that means that if there are any problems, the manager is on the landing. He sees my car come down the road to the hangar, and he says, I've got a problem for the boss. So he stands on the landing. And when I go up the stairs and I say, good morning, Bill, before I could get the second word out, he says, Governor, I've got a problem. So I go into his office and deal with the problem. So we have a form of instant management. And the net result of this is we don't have any staff industrial problems. And they're loyalists. They all work like mad and they sort of carry the flag for Fred all over the place all the time. Everyone is dedicated. And we don't cut any corners in maintenance or pilots. In fact, I was going to ask you about that. You know, for a long time, there were many people who were very skeptical of taking charter flights because they felt that the that the big carriers maintained the planes better, or that the planes were better built, or some such thing. I don't know. Let me ask you about your planes. Well, it's absolute rubbish. Uh, I have uh, the DC-10 that I bought new from the manufacturer, millions of dollars each. About thirty-five million dollars a shot. Well, that's the how much they cost now. I bought. The four I already have costs a bit less than that. But if you're operating an aeroplane that costs six pounds, I, I must get used to your funny money over here. It's funny. Yes. <laughs> um, but if you think of something like $10 a minute to fly an aeroplane, every time we are late, we have to feed the passengers. And we're spending our money. You know, it's just pouring out every time we're late. Every time we break down, we've got to put people in hotels. We've got to buy space from other carriers. It just isn't worth that anything to us to cut corners in terms of maintenance and spare parts. And of course, we have millions and millions of dollars of spare parts. We send our engineers to the manufacturers to be trained, or the radio companies, or the radar companies, the engine companies to be trained. We, we pay them the highest possible salary. We, we have, a, not only do we have a national health scheme in England, but we have a, our own pension scheme, we have our own sickness benefit scheme and holiday scheme and all that sort of thing to make sure that these people are happy in their work. Why did you pick the DC-10? Why not the 747 well, or the L-10? Well, the 747 is a very interesting aeroplane, but we think uh, from the studies we did that the DC-10 is cheaper per mile for us to operate and also it's a more flexible aeroplane remember that when our aeroplane gets back to London tomorrow morning it doesn't necessarily come back to Los Angeles or to New York it's very likely that it's going to do a package holiday trip to Palmer which is only 900 miles and the people have probably paid something like a hundred dollars for two weeks holiday including the jet fare so the airplane we need is very has to be very flexible and of course we can't always get for 150 people mm -hmm. to go on these package holidays mm -hmm. so we have the smaller airplane for flexibility but we also believe that for our job it is slightly cheaper per passenger mile than the 747 now, the TriStar was a very interesting airplane. How convinced are you of the reliability and safety of the DC-10 aircraft? Well, I'm totally convinced of the, of the DC-10. Um, we have done very well with the airplane. We've operated them now for just over five years, five and a half years. We've averaged well over 3,000 hours a year every year. We've got engines that are running now for 10,000 hours between overhauls, which is a, a phenomenal number of miles. In terms of fatigue on the aeroplane, we haven't come across any major fatigue on the aeroplane at all. And um, in fact, I can say without any fear of con 
contradiction that we've had no major problems with the airplane. Now, over the last 30 years or so that I've been buying, owning and operating airplanes, I've introduced new airplanes like the Viscount, the Britannia, the VC-10, uh, DC-6s, for example, in England, and a lot of other airplanes. And I can honestly say that the DC-10 is the best new airplane we have ever put into service. In other words, we've had less trouble with the DC-10 than any other airplane. But then, of course, it costs a lot more. It has the latest technology in it. You mean the baggage doors work? Well, our baggage doors have always worked. And I have to say this, with, that um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only t times that the doors have opened is when they weren't locked in the first place. Now, I will go further and say, of course, that uh, the design should be such that the door can never be left unlocked. But if you lock the door, it won't come undone. I want to leave the airline business now and get into the Freddie Laker story, but I have to pause for these announcements. We will continue with Sir Freddie Laker after these uh, words from our NBC stations. How did you get into the airline business, which is a short way of saying, where do you come from and how did you finally get to where you are today? Well, um, I'm the byproduct of a broken marriage, unfortunately. And uh, when I was a, a boy, I suppose I would have been about 14, something like that. It was a about 1936, yes it is a long time ago, I was standing on the street corner in Canterbury where I was, lived in England and I looked up and I saw the Hindenburg airship, mm -hmm. the German airship that was obviously on its way to America and at the same time in the air there was an Imperial Airways biplane, four engine biplane flying obviously from Croydon in London to Paris. I saw these two things in the air and I thought, that's for me. I'm going to do something in the aeroplane business. And when I left school at the age of 16, you know, we don't have, we didn't have mature students in England in those days. Uh, I went to Short Brothers as a boy and my very first job was sweeping the floor. Now, what is Short Brothers? Are? Short Brothers was an aeroplane manufacturer, oh, made flying boats. Okay. They are claimed to be the first aeroplane constructor in the world. And I went there, and I had got my first job, that was sweeping the floor. One hour later, I got my second job, that was making the tea. <laughs> and uh, I stayed there until the factory was bombed uh, during the war. And then I went into the ATA, which was a, a, an organization for ferrying aircraft. And I stayed there until the end of March 1946. And on April Fool's Day 1946, I worked for British European Airways for three months. And I left and started in business on my own. What did you do first when you started your own business? Well, I did several things. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money, of course, and I had a van, um, a small pickup, I think mm -hmm. we would call it, and uh, I bought some government surplus aeroplane spare parts, and I was selling those, and I also, because I, I needed as much cash as I could get, of course, I bought bedding plants, which are the sort of little baby plants mm -hmm. from a nursery, and I went round to the houses and knocked on the doors and said, Madam, would you like some bedding plants for your garden? And um, I wasn't very good at this job, of course, I did, really didn't understand it. And to identify the plants, I had a leaf of each one with a drawing pin pinned on the back of the van. And I couldn't s spell, the, spell the plant antirinium, so I wrote anti under that, you see. And the ladies would say to me, I want a dozen antiriniums, and I'd go back and look at the leaf and compare it with the one in the box. <laughs> so I'd sell them, sell them some plants that way. And I did that, and I sold my spare parts, and slowly and surely I uh, got some money together, and I bought government surplus airplanes and sold them. And then, uh, very early in 1948, I'd 
been selling airplanes for a Scotsman by the name of Bobby Sanderson. Travel with his airplanes, and he said, "This was my real big break in life." And he said to me, "Freddie, you've done such a terrific job for me. Can I help you?" I said, "Well, not really." So he said, "Well, if you if you had the money, what would you do?" I said, "If I had the money, I would buy a fleet of surplus airplanes from British Airways or BAC, as it was in those days." And he said, "How much?" There were twelve airplanes, six hundred tons of spare parts. And they were converted bombers, Halifax bombers. I said, well, they're forty-two thousand pounds the lot. He said, uh, you mean for all twelve? All airplanes, twelve airplanes and, and all the, the spare parts. Yeah. I had six hundred tons of spare parts. So I said, uh, well, forty-two thousand. He said, well, how much have you got? I said, four. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm hoping for the other forty-one nine nine so, six. Right. Anyway, uh, we, we were having a drink in a pub at the time, and he walked away from me, sat at a table and came back and he handed me a cheque for £38,000, the difference. So he said, go and buy the airplanes. So I said, well, when do you want the money back? He said, when you've got it. I said, how about interest? He said, none. He said, I wouldn't have had any money if you hadn't got me out of trouble. And I bought the airplanes and um, lo and behold, three months later, the big Berlin airlift started. So I sold six of the airplanes to other people, and I kept six, and we flew them for one year and 14 days between Hamburg and Berlin. And we did over 4,000 flights with them. And I had enough spare parts, of course, to maintain mine and everybody <laughs> else's as well. And uh, I made quite a lot of money by, by those standards, the standards in those days. How did you pay back the guy who loaned you the 38000 Besides from, just paying him back the money, what else? Do I know just from sitting here with you that well, you must have done something well, besides give him his money back. Well, I gave him his money back. And then I said, how much do I? You please let me. No, you can't give me anything. So I said, well, I've got to do something. He said, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. And I really didn't give him anything at all except that he and his brother were, of course, great, great friends of mine until the day they both of them died. And, of course, the, the family and I are still very fr great friends, good friends. I would think a pass on yeah. the airline would be in order. Well, but he could have anything. He just didn't want anything. That's a real friend, though. He didn't want anything at all. That's a real friend, and so is the yeah. guy that takes you out to lunch and pays cash and doesn't ask for a receipt. Those are friends. Yeah, they're real they're friends, very, but they don't come very often, they surely you know? don't. Now, how does it feel to be a knight? Is, 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 is it a thrill for you, well, growing up in the, in the system with the monarchy? And well, being a monarchist and a royalist, and b I honestly believe that, that our queen and her family are Britain's greatest assets, without any doubt whatsoever. Um, I'm obviously proud and overjoyed to think that th our country still has that great depth of character, because I fought every government, regardless of its political persuasion for the last 30 years. I've been rude and insulted every minister, and we've had 22 of them since the war. I've insulted the civil servants uh, unmercifully. And at the end of the day, they come up the straight and bury all of this thing and say, well done, Freddie Laker, give me a pat on the back, and the Queen gives me a knighthood. And I think that this demonstra demonstrates the, the fact that Great Britain is still great, and the British people have a great depth of character about them. Is it a thrill for you when you see that DC-10 coming in with your name on it, Laker Airways? That's got to be a tremendous thrill to see that. I, I, I mean, I watched your commercial where you say, well, I put my name on the plane, yeah. folks. Yeah. It's incredible. Uh, after all these years and having been in the business and the roughs and the tumbles and everything that goes with it, I can tell you that if I see one of my airplanes out on the tarmac, I turn around and look at it. And if I see one rolling down the runway, I stop to see it take off. And if I see one on the approach, I stop to see it land. And every time I think to myself, my God, how lucky you've been, Freddie Laker. It's an absolute thrill, I assure you. Do you fly your own airline? Uh, 
as often as I can that we have pretty good load factors, you know, on our airline and sometimes have to fly with other people. Now, how come you have so many rules like you have to, you can't buy a seat in advance and there are no ad advance reservations? You have to call the same day, I think. Uh, well, um, it depends on the service. The Skytrain service, of course, there are no rules. You can go when you like, come back when you like. The only minor restriction is that you buy the ticket the day you want to travel. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you can do anything. Uh, of course, a lot of the rules have been cut to ribbons in the last six months. Uh, remember, we've carried 145,000 people on the SkyTrain service, and it's really started to hurt people. Uh, for example, six months ago, uh, our advance purchase flights were 45 days advance purchase. They're only 21 days now, and there are all sorts of other regulations that have been sort of just cut out with a great big knife by the, uh, the, the Civil Aeronautics Board uh, here in Washington. You know what's going to happen? You're, you and your colleagues now, all the other world carriers, international carriers, will eventually promote these SkyTrain services, no frills, uh, chicken feed fares, that one day some smart dude's going to come up, come up with an all frills fare where you pay an exorbitant price and you get your own compartment, you get hot and cold running water, you get showers, you get beautiful oh. meals, graceful service, and it's going to be for the wealthy people who don't want to fly no frills. But I agree with this. And this, well, when are you going to start? Well, this is, exactly, <laughs> this is exactly what I have been saying for 30 years. We had to take the airlines out of the realm of being sacred cows. We had to put them back into the marketplace to buy and sell their business like the rest of us. After all, this is consumer democracy. It's the price service option. If you've got the money, if you've got the time and the will, you can go on Concord. I call it tomorrow today. If you have no money and no time and no will, you've got Shank's Pony. You walk. If you've got a tiny little bit more, teeny weeny bit more, you can go on SkyTrain. And there's a whole range of things be, 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 between Concord and, uh, and Shank's Pony. And I think it's your right and my right to have it. And if there's a crazy man in this world that wants to produce an all singing, all dancing air service, totally first class and, you know, they pour champagne in your ears, I think the public should have the right to use it. And if there's a nutcase that wants to do it, I think he should have the right to lose his own money or make a profit if he, if he can. And I think this is what de consumer democracy is all about. And I've been fighting to get this in the world of air transport. And we're only now getting to the point where we've had some success. And I assure you that not in the not too distant future, someone, some nutcase, is actually going to produce an all-first-class service mm -hmm. between L.A. and London. It won't be me, because I've made a very, very good living for th over 30 years out of the cheap end of the market. My friends, the, the students and the old-age pensioners and those sort of people, the working-class people, I know it's, it's not the right sort of thing, but they are working-class people, they're nice people. They've given me a damn good living for 30 years. And I think that I should stay with them. Okay. I'm glad we could finally have this chat. I'm sorry we couldn't do it in New York last year, but uh, we just couldn't do well, it. Well, we did try. Yes, we, we surely did. <laughs> Thanks, sir, Freddie. Thank you. All right. Thank sir. you. We will continue after these words from our sponsors.